the starry host declare glory. told the existing rulers that if he had a kingdom, it was not in direct competition with theirs. And though he seemed to alienate the rich and powerful, he died an ignoble death. He died the kind of death that was meant for thieves, scalawags, people who who were not honored. You see, in Roman times, if you were going to receive a clean death, instead of being beheaded or put on a cross to be humiliated, they would stab you through your spine to kill you instantly so that you wouldn't have to feel the pain and it would leave yourself intact so that at your burial, everything on the front of you looked okay.
A death on the cross, however, is kind of prettied up by Hollywood standards. Because when you were whipped, you were stripped naked in front of a crowd. You were humiliated completely. And you were left to hang there and die, and you asphyxiated based off of your inability to pull yourself up to take a breath until you tired to the point of exhaustion. And while that person scream on a cross, people would watch. But here's the kicker. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I'm going to give it up willingly. And he goes to this with a purpose. Well, that makes it a little bit deeper of a love. The key in this promise made by God is found through the prophet Nathan to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We see some interesting history here. We see how a, a, a track was set for King David for this high office that he was called to. He would follow up with King Saul's up and down leadership. King David would, would follow and not be a guy normally you would think would be a king. You see, the people picked Saul because the scripture says he was head and shoulders above everybody else. All the normal average guys, King Saul was head and shoulders above all of them. He stuck out a good foot above everybody around him. He looked like a king. David, the scripture describes as a ruddy guy. Ruddy skin, reddish hair. He doesn't look like that guy who played him in, 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 for Hollywood. He's not this good-looking guy who, who, is, who is acting out. It was a guy who was a ruddy-skinned, reddish-hair, shorter guy. He wasn't a likely king. But how would we know, as we look at this picture... That Jesus comes on and the scripture describes him as being calmly. He was a guy who just didn't stick out of the crowd. He didn't seem like a likely king. Watch this. It would be by his purposeful actions for you and for me. His choice to grow up and head into Jerusalem, like I've said so many times, and walk out with a cross. King Jesus. And although David was an unlikely king, God would have to step in and intercede with a lot of the things that David struggled with. His desires to serve the Lord were big. He wanted to build a palace, but it wouldn't be David that built the temple. It would be his son. Now, God would build a house for David. And as David took uh, the throne, which is the Ark of the Covenant, around and brought it into Jerusalem and moved, according to 2 Samuel chapter 6, the, the uh, capital to Jerusalem, he did his best to honor God. He didn't quite know that he had been chosen to supply a way of salvation for the world through his lineage. You see, here's the kicker. God sees our failings and then purposes to give you a way out of that. God sees where we fall on our face and he says, I've got a better way for you to live. Watch this church. God sees you struggling in a relationship or with your kids or in your work. And he says again, follow me. For in Christ, we have hope. In Christ, we have joy. In Christ, we find love. As we look at these things and we try to put them together, when we hear sermons and we talk about this Jesus and we know that he's this guy who sacrificed himself for us, 
I think we miss the gravity of the situation. He's not asking to be a band-aid over a bullet hole. He's not asking to be your quick fix. He's asking you and I to commit to him eternally and make him the Lord of our life. Amen. To claim him as king. Kingship, lordship. To make him king means we would submit to the authority of who he is, watch this, in every aspect of our life. That he controls your work. He controls your marriage. He controls your children. He controls the way you bring them up. He controls your character on how you interact <laughs> with your spouse and with your children and with your friends at work or with your peers in school. He controls all of those things because you say, I am choosing to make you the Lord of my life. And when we choose to make him the Lord of our life, when we say he's king, is he really king over everything? Is he king over our finances? Is he king over our home? Is he king over our hobbies? Is Jesus Christ king? Why? Why would we choose? You see, every family connected to the royal line would remember the promise of Yahweh. When Jesus comes onto the scene, <coughs> On the basis of 2 Samuel 7, Jesus was born a king. He came from the line of David. When he came into uh, Jerusalem, the people shouted out, Hosanna to the son of David. They expected a king. When they were laying the palm fronds down after, after witnessing the miracles that he did, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, son of David. They were expecting a king. They were expecting a guy to fix it. They were expecting, Lord, get me out of this mess right now. Remove the Romans from the world. Fix my life. Fix my marriage. Fix my kids. Fix my life. Watch this. They wanted a physical fix. Let me ask you a question 2016, right where we are. Are you expecting just a physical fix in your life? And did you miss that he is still Lord of all? Did you miss that the gift is your eternity with him? Did you miss that the gift is your eternity with him? Did you miss the gift is the eternity of your children, your grandchildren? The importance of knowing that he paid everything purposely on a cross so that it could be so. So too with God's long planned activity of salvation. The people expected a king to meet their own needs and not to do what's in the best interest of themselves. You see, the proclamation of Jesus is the hope of the world where love has first <coughs> been given. We read a scripture this morning on John 3, 16. It's been so played out almost. We just know it automatically, but we don't think about what it is actually saying. That God so love the world, okay. No, 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 let's put, let's put it this way. So God so loved you, even if you were the last person in this world, he would have died for you. God so loved me and you, he gives his only son. Okay, he gave his son, I, I, I get it. He gave his son, maybe, maybe not. How deep is that love? How deep is something like that, that he would give his only son, that he would give his child, that he, well, what is that? If God came to me in some odd way and said, okay, everybody in, you, in this church can go to heaven, Tom, I'd be, amen, that's awesome. Everybody's going, I can come tell everybody, everybody's going, he says, hold up. Take your youngest child 
and let him go nail her to a tree. I would hate to tell you that I don't love you enough to sacrifice my own child for you. I couldn't do it. You see, my love, my, my understanding of that sacrifice is not deep enough to love you that much. But God loved you that much. He gives his child sacrificially and in himself, God incarnate, he consciously grows up God incarnate and he goes to the cross on purpose. If you've not seen Ben-Hur, the new version of it, there's smatterings of Jesus throughout this thing. If you saw the old one, uh, you'll recall there's a scene where at the end of the movie, Judah Ben-Hur is restored to his name. And in the beginning of the movie, Jesus encounters him and tells him that you need to love your enemies. And he says, that's stupid. Basically, and he walks off. Midway through the movie, while he is being beaten, Jesus is the one who comes and gives him a cold cup of water. That's his encounter with him. And then all the way near the end of the movie, Jesus encounters him, or he encounters Jesus on the road to Golgotha, carrying a cross. And he goes to give him a cup of water, and the Roman soldier won't let him. And he was apologetically wanting to tell Jesus, man, I, I, I'm sorry, I tried to get you a cup of water, I, I tried to do this for you. And Jesus says something very poignant that is scriptural, he says, I'm choosing to give my life. And it hits him. God purposely chooses to give his life for you. That even while we were yet sinning, Christ died for us. He says, in the middle of what you're doing, in the middle of what you're choosing to do, I'm going to die for you. And guess what? You don't have any say in it. I give my life of my own accord. It's an important scripture verse we all need to understand. It comes out of the Gospel of John. Chapter 10 and verse 18 no one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. And I have the authority to take it back up. <clears throat> Jesus dies because he loves you. And he loves me. Watch this. Even more, we're doing all the stupid stuff that we do. Even while we're doing all the stuff that we hide. Even while we're doing all the things that we fail so miserably at. He still says, I'm going to die purposely for you. Now here's the kicker. Will we live for him? Will you accept lordship? Will you accept him to be your king? So it is with Jesus. The proclamation of Jesus is the hope of the world and love has first been given. So it is with him. Number one, providence. God gave unique testimony of love through the nation of Israel. He purposed to bring you and I and reconcile us back to him in a fallen world. He elects the nation of Israel he takes the one son and he elects the nation of Israel and he says, I am going to purpose to bring you back into a relationship with me. Providence, revelation then, God comes to live with us in the person of Jesus Christ so that he can be tempted, so that he can know everything you've gone and everything you've been subject to and everything you've ever been tempted by so that he can say on the cross, it is finished. 
so that three, salvation, out of love, God reconciles the world to himself. You see, God's love is the gift of Christmas. Watch this. Through the purposeful actions of Jesus Christ. Now watch. Will you purposely, in everything you do, will you purposely live for him? Let's stand together. Our Heavenly Father.